All right. <clears throat> Won't you open your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 2? Matthew, chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm going to <clears throat> use this uh, scripture today, part of it, for this morning service and part of it for tonight's service, but it will be two totally different sermons. I'm trying to bring you stuff that can enlighten you uh, about the Christmas story so you uh, <clears throat> pay close attention. I want to begin by reading you a story, and I want you to pay close attention because this will parallel with what I want to share with you today. There's a story told of an old monastery that had fallen upon hard times. It was once a great order, but as a result of waves of anti-monastic persecution in the 17th and 18th centuries and the rise of secularism in the 19th century, all its branch houses were lost and it had become decimated to the extent that there was only five monks left in this decaying <clears throat> mother house. The abbot, or the head, and four others, all over 70 years in age. Clearly, it was a dying order. Things looked grim. In the deep woods surrounding the monastery, there was a little hut that had a rabbi from a nearby town, he, and he occasionally used this hut for a hermitage or a place to come out, <coughs> come out and be alone and meditate. <clears throat> Through their many years of prayer and contemplation, the old monks had become a bit psychic. So they could always sense when the rabbi was in the hermitage. The rabbi is in the woods. The rabbi is in the woods again, they would whisper to each other. As he agonized over the imminent death of his order, it occurred to the abbot on one of those occasions to visit the hermitage and ask the rabbi, if by some possible chance he could offer any advice that might save the monastery. <clears throat> the rabbi welcomed the abbot at his hut. But when the abbot explained the purpose of his visit, the rabbi could only commemorate him. I know how it is, he explained. The spirit has gone out of the people. It is the same in my town. Almost no one comes to the synagogue anymore. So the old abbot and the old rabbi just wept together. They talked for a while, while <clears throat> they talked for a while, and then the time came when the abbot had to leave. They embraced each other. It has been a wonderful thing that we should meet after all these years, the abbot said. But I have still failed in my purpose for coming here. Is there nothing that you can tell me, no piece of advice that you can give me that would help me to save my dying order. <laughs> no, <clears throat> I am sorry, the rabbi responded. I have no advice to give you. The only thing that I can tell you is that the Messiah is one of you. <laughs> when the abbot returned to the monastery, his fellow monks gathered around him to ask, well, what did the rabbi say? He couldn't help, the abbot explained. We just wept and we read the Torah together. The only thing he did say, just as I was leaving, it was something very cryptic. He simply said, the Messiah is one of you. I don't know what he meant. <clears throat> In the days and <clears throat> the weeks and months that followed, the old monks pondered this, and they wondered whether there was any possible significance to the rabbi's words. The Messiah is one of us. Could he possibly have meant that one of us monks here at the monastery? If that's the case, then which one of us? Do you suppose he meant Father Abbott, I mean, he has been our leader for more than a generation. On the other hand, he might have meant Brother Thomas. Certainly, Brother Thomas is a holy man. Everyone knows that Thomas is a man <clears throat> of light. 
Certainly he could not have meant Brother Elrod. See, Elrod, he seemed so grumpy at times. But, come to think about it, even though he is a thorn in people's sides, when you look back on it, Elrod is virtually always right. Often very right. Maybe the rabbi did mean Brother Elrod, but surely Brother Philip. Now, Philip is passive, a real nobody. But then, almost mysteriously, he has a gift for somehow always being there when you need him. He just magically appears by your side. Maybe Philip is the Messiah. Of course, the rabbi didn't mean me. <laughs> he couldn't possibly have meant me. I'm just so ordinary. Yet, supposing he did. Suppose I am to be the Messiah. Oh, God, not me. I couldn't be that much for you. Could I? As they each contemplated in this matter, the old folk, the old monks, began to treat one another with extraordinary love and respect on the off chance that one among them might be the Messiah. And on the off, off chance that each monk himself might be the Messiah, they began to treat themselves with extraordinary love and respect. <laughs> because the forest is what it <clears throat> was, because the forest in which it was situated was beautiful, it so happened that people still occasionally came to visit the monastery to have a picnic on its tiny lawn, to wander among some of its paths, <clears throat> even now and then goes to, goes to go into the, into the dilapidated buildings to meditate. As they did so, without even being conscious of it, they, sen they sensed the aura of an extraordinary love and respect that now began to surround the five monks. And it seemed to radiate out from them and permeate the atmosphere of the place. There was something strangely attractive, even compelling about it. Hardly knowing why, they began to come back to the monastery to picnic, to play, to pray. Its beauty drew them in. They began to bring their friends to show them what this special place was like, and their friends brought other friends. Then it happened that some of the younger men who came to visit the monastery started to talk more and more with the old monks. After a while, one asked if he could join them, then another, and another. So within a few years, the monastery had once again become a thriving order, and thanks <clears throat> to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm. The church can be an amazing place when it's working as it's supposed to, when we are treating one another as if each person were Christ himself, when we are following the command Jesus left to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think about that this morning. It only took something they already had to change their life and their situation and to change the lives of people <clears throat> around them. And as I share the word with you this morning, I want you to keep that in mind. The Messiah, that be one of you. And if we really believe that, would we begin to treat each other differently? Suppose someone said the Messiah is in Waycross. Would you begin to treat people around you differently? And remember, whenever Jesus came forth, he was just like everybody else. He was poor, a carpenter, a young boy. But the whole time God had his hand on him. Would you, would you begin to treat people differently? Now, let's look at the story and see what Jesus had to say. In Matthew chapter 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he, didn't, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Now go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Father, <clears throat> today we read your word as we've read so many times in our lives. We've all heard these scriptures. But God, I'm asking you today to make these scriptures become life. Let us see it in a different way. Let us hear it in a different way. Father, I pray you open every heart and every mind. I speak against every distraction that the Satan would bring in this building today. I speak against it. And Lord, I ask you to open every ear that we may hear what thus saith the Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Christmas time. The most joyous <coughs> season of the year. Now, <coughs> if you were here yesterday, and by the way, Doris, it's good to see you in church. I saw Richard come in, but I didn't see you until later on. But it's so good to have Doris back in church. Amen. She's been really sick. Yesterday in the, in the funeral, God shared something with me I'd never thought about before, honest to goodness, and you would never, ever do it in a funeral. But I'm just that crazy. When God tells me something, I do it and let, let it go where it will. But I walked up here at the very first of the sermon, and I said to them, Merry Christmas. Certainly everybody was caught off guard because that's, we were at a funeral. <clears throat> everybody was supposed to be sad. But I began to share with them what God had told me. I'll ask you the same question I asked them. Why did you say Merry Christmas? Does anybody have any idea why you say it? What does it mean? And when somebody says Merry Christmas to you, what do you, what do, you do? You're supposed to say Merry Christmas back, Right? All right, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right. Now, why didn't you do that the first time? Get cranked up. All right. The second sermon starts at 12.01, Tom. You'll be cranked up by then. <clears throat> why do we say Merry Christmas? It's the season. It's the season when the baby was born. Our Savior, the Redeemer of the world, was born. And they said his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. So no matter where we go, what we do, God is with us. Merry Christmas. See, No matter what you go through in life, Merry Christmas in this season. Supposedly the happiest occasion and season of the year, people are totally different at Christmas. We must remember that Jesus is with us. Amen. And all the trials and all the tribulations and all the frustrations we go through, Merry Christmas, see? Merry Christmas. Every time someone says Merry Christmas to you, it should remind you God is with me. Amen. And for a split second, forget your problems. God is with me. Every time you speak the words, Merry Christmas to somebody, it ought to remind you for just a split second, Jesus is with me. Everything's going to be okay. I'm fine. You're fine. We're fine. Merry Christmas. And it is a Merry Christmas. This season is not about gifts. It's not about toys. It's not about all those things. 
Oh, they've come into the picture. But this season is about Jesus Christ. We must never, ever forget what the season is all about. And that's why we say Merry Christmas. But when you walk into a store and you can't find the gift you want and you walk outside and you're all ticked off and don't know what you're going to do now, somebody says Merry Christmas, you walk on. Because it's not a Merry Christmas. I didn't find what I wanted. But I want you to know, in the way it's presented, it has nothing to do with whether you find your gift or whether you get what you want, whether somebody treats you right, whether you enjoy it. It has nothing to do with it. Christmas season is all about Jesus Christ, the baby that was sent for our sins. <clears throat> we, we, we do it right. The authors have it right. The songwriters have it right. Oh, this is the happiest time ever. And we sing... It's the most wonderful time of the year. We sing that, and we love that. The only problem is, so many times, it's not. We're rushing here, and we're rushing there. T traffic is so bad, and somebody won't let me get in the right way, lane, and we can't get this right, and we can't get that right, and it certainly is not the most wonderful time of the year right now. So we say, bah humbug. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm in trouble. And I want you to be as miserable as I am. Bah humbug. Now remember, we don't answer them back, do we? Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You got to get warmed up, don't you? Bah humbug. Merry Christmas. <laughs> that should be our response. But we don't say bah humbug. But we were supposed to respond to Merry Christmas. So we don't sing that song sometimes. Have a holly jolly Christmas. Oh, a wonderful song. But I'm not jolly because I can't find what I'm looking for. And I'm not jolly because I didn't get the bike I wanted. And I'm not jolly because I can't didn't get the gun I want. I'm not jolly. Holly, holy, empty Christmas. We'd sing that if we can. We sang songs like, Chestnuts resting by an open fire. Oh, what, what do you, when you sing that song, what do you think about? I'm just laid back. I'm in the mountains. We got a fire going over in the pit. And we say things like, it don't get no better than this. But unfortunately, we don't do that because things are so bad at work. It's horrible. And I can't even imagine roasting chestnuts by the fire. I don't have time to do it to begin with. And it's, a, it's just something way out there. I'm not going to be able to do it. So all of a sudden it leaves us. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, that one gets excited, doesn't it? Now, the kids know that one. And we're, we're happy. It's a good time. You know, that's a song that's upbeat. But we're sad. We're sad. And we've lost loved ones. Other things aren't good. Memories are bad. So jingle bells. We don't sing that one. We don't do it. I'm walking in the wind and wonderland. What do you get with that one? Oh man. I snow it, man. Snow. And I'm traipsing through the woods, me and Jack and the three boys. <laughs> and I'm watching them as they walk along, and they give me a cane, and I'm making my way up there. Man, we climbed a hill. That boys wanted to climb a hill. They didn't want to go around it, so we climbed a hill. It like a mountain to me. And they climbed that hill. And on the other side was our cabin. So I could walk around, or I could go up. I'm going up over the hill. So Jack says, Danny, you wait right there now. He got the boys up top. He come back down, and I walked up that hill with him. Got on top of that hill and looked back down. I said, I did it. Okay? I did it. That's a memory I've got. The snow. Last time we went, man, snow. We got snowed in for four days. My goodness, it was a dream of mine come true. Oh, what a thought, you know, walking in a winter wonderland. But, see, there's a problem. We don't get snow, do we? So we've changed the word to that when it just says, I'm walking in the scorching summer heat. <laughs> Ain't no joy in that, is there? You see, 
things take the joy. Things define joy. And we are happy and we are sad because everything doesn't work out for us. Therefore, when someone says, Merry Christmas, we say, Merry Christmas, walk on because we're supposed to respond. But I challenge you this morning, Jesus is the reason for the season, and we need to spread the Christmas joy to everybody that we can, and we don't say Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. No, we should tell them Merry Christmas with a smile. We should let them know it is because of something, not these things in our life that are physical things, but because of the real meaning. Jesus is with me, and though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Merry Christmas. You see, we got to get excited. It means something. It means something. Let the lady or the man at the, at the Salvation Army look at you and say, Merry Christmas, because they want you to put something in the kettle. But turn back to them and say, Merry Christmas. And let them realize what the reason is for. It's not to gain something. It is to give something. And we need to share Jesus Christ in this way. But personal problems, a crisis, our work, we can rise again above all this if we want to and make this a Merry Christmas. I don't care how your family is doing. I don't care how you are doing. The one that is the sickest, the one that's hurting the most, the one that's the poorest, the one that has no friends, the one that's despondent, the one that's in despair, the one that's discouraged, they can have a great season if you choose to have a season to represent Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Amen. Now what I want to do for a moment, I want you to look at something. We're going to look at three little points. I want us to look at the, the, the wise men. I almost said the three wise men. I want you to look at the wise men. We want to talk about them for a few moments. When, when we start looking at them, we don't really know a whole lot about them, do we? We don't really know where they came from. We don't really know what they were. We, we don't know how many of them they were. We're not told there were three of them. They're the wise men. And they go, gave gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold, frankincense and myrrh, that's three things. must have been three people. So we don't know how many there were. We don't, know, we don't know a lot about them. We don't know how long they've been traveling. We don't know how they understood the, the meaning of the stars. We really don't know how they were able to follow a star. Do stars move? Either the stars move or the earth moves. <clears throat> if stars don't move, then how are they able to follow it? See, it, there's a lot we don't know. <clears throat> but there are some things we do know about them. And there are some things that, that we should parallel this Christmas after with these wise men. <clears throat> it says they were magi. Wise men, astrologers, possibly kings. We don't know. They were something. And we know they, they came from over here and followed a star supposedly to Jesus. All right? That's the premise we're going to work on this morning. The first thing is, during this Christmas season, we must make a vow to never, ever do what we're going to do until we know what we are looking for. You must know in this Christmas season what you're looking for. The, <clears throat> in your Christmas shopping, do you ever walk into a store and somebody says, what are you doing? They say, I'm looking for a Christmas present. I say, okay, what do you want? I don't know. I just thought I'd walk around and something would just jump up and say, this is me, buy me. I wish I could shop like that. So a lot of things we do, we don't have a purpose, we don't have a plan. The intentions are maybe are right, but we're not, we're not, we don't, we don't have a purpose. We don't have a reason. We're just doing things. In this Christmas season, you must focus, come up with a plan, and know what you're seeking. Now, <clears throat> it says this. 
Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. They, there are some that have said they could have been traveling for a year or two. Don't know. Then it says this, And the wise men said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. This morning, we need to understand that the wise men said they had been following a star, and they were following that star, seeking the child, Jesus, because they had come to worship him. Their purpose for following that star was to find the baby so they could worship him. Now, wherever they came from, somebody knew about the baby being born. Somebody had read the prophecy, maybe the one that Isaiah wrote, saying that there would be a child born. He would be the savior of the world. His name would be Emmanuel. And he would be born in the town of Bethlehem in a manger. They knew something about what the, the, the events that were going to occur. And it says, so they then got their caravan up and they began to go to Bethlehem. Now, just hold that thought. Bethlehem. They were following a star. So we, we have to believe in, in our mentality, we have to believe that star was moving. Now, God could have done it other ways. I don't, I don't really know. But they were following a star. And the star was given by God to lead these men to Bethlehem. That was... <clears throat> That was the first GPS that was ever invented. We think we're so smart. It was God's positioning system. He led them. They had dialed in on their little hand computers. And they said, here it is. And I guess Siri or Siri or somebody would say, no, no, back up, go left. They, had direct, they were following the star. They knew where the, they didn't know where they were going. They knew they were following the star, and they were following that star because they knew it would lead them to the baby Jesus, and they were there to worship him. Now, forget that they were try, their, their purpose was to find the baby. Their purpose was to worship him. I ask you a question this morning. Why are you in church today? Think about it. What was your purpose for coming to church? And it should be to worship him. <clears throat> if, if it wasn't to worship him, then, then you're just you know, a generality. You're just moving about with no purpose, no aim. You're just wandering back and forth. You have to have a purpose. Well, I can worship him at home. Thank you. Yes, you certainly can. And the wise men could have worshipped him from the Far East too. But Jesus said, no, you need to come to him and worship him in purpose, in person. So they did. Why are you in church this morning? It should be to worship Jesus. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. To worship the Lord. Why? Because Emmanuel, he is with us. He is our Savior, our Redeemer. He is with us. And we must have a purpose for what we're doing. If you're not careful in this Christmas season, you'll wish for things like family unity. You'll wish for things like we're going to get together and we're going to have a good time as a family. You'll be wishing for the right gift. You'll be hoping that somebody accepts your gift and they're happy with it. It was the right size, the right kind, the right type, that they'll be happy with it. But if that's what your purpose for Christmas is, I promise you, you will be in great sorrow before this season is over. Because families don't love like they once did. We have a vision of what we would like, but that doesn't happen very often anymore in families. If you get the gift you want, you will be a very blessed person. Most of the time, we get something other than the one we want. 
And if we do get the one we want, it might be the wrong color, the wrong size, the wrong shade. You're going to be disappointed. If you focus on this Christmas on the physical things that we can think of that we define Christmas with, you are going to be disappointed. But I'll tell you the reason for the season is Jesus Christ, and we should be here today to worship him. And all throughout this season, we should be to worship him. And we should have the joy of the Lord because he's with us, and we're going to worship him. Now, that's my mindset. That's my idea. That's my goal. And if I fill that goal out, then no matter what happens around me, I still have the joy of the Lord. Amen. 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 Refocus. They came to worship the king. Next, you, can't, you not only have to look for the right thing, you got to look in the right place. I want you to think about something for a moment. They had been told somewhere to follow the star, and it would lead them to the Christ child. And they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh to give to the child. So they get on their journey, and they start going for however long. And all of a sudden, we see them as they detour and go to Jerusalem. Now, something's not right. They were told to follow the star. And they got to Jerusalem, and they stopped there. Not Bethlehem. And all of a sudden, they begin to ask people, do you know where this baby Jesus, this baby king. Do you know where this savior of the world is? We've come to worship him. And it begins to stir in the city. There's a murmur going around. And it gets back to the king. And the king then talks to these wise men. And they said, what are you doing? They said, well, listen, we, we fought a star from the east, and we're coming to find Jesus, and we want to worship him as the Savior of the world. You're talking to the leader. You're telling him there's another leader, the Savior of the world. That goes over good. So he calls his wise men together. He said, listen, this guy says he's looking for this baby Jesus, the Savior of the world. You know anything about that? They said, sure we do. Well, tell me. Well, according to the prophets of old, it says that there would be a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem, and he would be the ruler of the world, the savior of the world. Oh. So he turns to the wise men and says, he tells them the same thing, and he, he says, you go on down the road, and you'll find Bethlehem, and there you'll find that child, and when you find the child, come back and tell me so I can worship him. Why in the world did they stop in Jerusalem? It's crazy. They were following God. He had GPS already fixed on them. Can you imagine when they got turned off the road and went to Jerusalem? She comes on the phone. She says, take the next exit and turn around and go back left. You're on the wrong road. We, let me recalculate now. I'll tell you how to do it again. It just, it's crazy because all of a sudden they're in the wrong place. Trying to do the right thing in the wrong place. And whenever the king tells them, they turn around, go back to where they got off, and all of a sudden they saw the star again. And they followed the star to Bethlehem as it lit right over the manger. I would encourage you this morning to make sure that you know where to look and that you're looking for the right place. Because when God leads us, he has a place that he wants us to be in our life at any given moment. And as he leads us there, what a joy it is. But there are so many people that have gotten off of that track because they thought physically this was the right thing. In my mind, I believe we can do, I believe we can go, I think we can do, I think we can do this. And they got off of that track. The star is still there where we're supposed to be, but we're over here, and we're seeking something over here that is over here, and we're in trouble. Somebody told me one time, they said, you know, I'm just having the hardest time in the world finding me a boyfriend. It just seems like that every boyfriend I got winds up drinking, or he winds up, you know, cheating on me. He winds up doing this, winds up doing this. I'll tell you, I, I just, I don't know what to do. 
And I said very quickly, then why don't you change the place that you're looking for? Why don't you get out of the bars? Why don't you get out of those clubs and those parties where you go all the time where you're looking for the right people? Why don't you get out of there and go to church and find you a person of God? You're looking in the wrong place. And I believe there are many people in God's house that are looking in the wrong place today. We're looking over here because it makes more sense to us over here, but yet here we are right here in the stars right there, and what we're looking for is right in front of us. Make sure that you're looking in the right place. Lastly, as they now get there, it says, And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where this Christ child will be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now it says that they get back out there, and they go to Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, they follow the star right to the manger where the baby is. Right to it. That's what GPS does for you. It will take you. I, <clears throat> I went somewhere the other day, got on the wrong road, stopped and keyed it in, and it started telling me what to do. And I said, I don't care if I wind up in Jacksonville, which I was headed in the other direction. If I wind up there, I don't care. I'm going to follow everything it tells me to do. I followed everything it told me to do. And it took me through some back roads, some dirt roads, some paved roads, I think through some barns and different stuff. And I wound up exactly at the place I wanted to go to. There are going to be times in our lives where the path that God leads us is not straight. There are going to be, there are going to be situations out there that's not going to please us. We're not going to like it. There are going to be ways that we could do it a better way if we just, you know, go over here and do this. But you better understand, God has a perfect plan, and where he leads me, I will follow. Because I know where he leads me, he will take me to the place that I need to be. So they get there, and now they begin to give the baby gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Think about it. Gold, because they knew he was to be a king. Frankincense. Representing priest. That's what the priest would use in the temple. They would burn frankincense to put off that odor that was so pleasing to God. And they knew that Christ was to be our priest. And they gave him myrrh. Myrrh is what you put on the body when you go to bury it. They knew that this king would suffer and he would die. They brought gifts that were meaningful that day to them. Had we have been there and had been one of us and we knew this was a newborn baby, we would have bought diapers, we would have bought milk. We'd have bought pampers, and we'd have bought this and this, and a nice outfit here, and one, you know. That's what we'd have bought, because that's what makes sense. But Jesus said, if you'll listen to me, I'll tell you what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to give when you get there. It's just that simple. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So make sure when you're worshiping the Lord this winter, this, this season, that you know exactly what to give. What does he expect? We've got to give the right thing. We've got to be in the right place. And we've got to give the right gift. It's, it's special for us today that we give what Jesus expects us to give. And what is that? Our best. Whatever it is. Sometimes your best may be that day. Merry Christmas. It may be. Oh, that's silly. Really? Why did the wise men go to Jerusalem? They had a mental lapse. They had a spiritual lapse. They were doing what they were supposed to do. For some reason, they looked over there and turned in there. Why did they do that? They got off track. They had to get back on track to find Jesus. Are you looking for Jesus today and you can't find him? Are you looking to ch for changes in your life but you can't find out how to do it? You're looking for something spiritual in your life. You'd like to grow closer and be this and that and that, but you can't find it. Have you ever considered that you're in the wrong place? I'm not talking about the church. You're looking in the wrong place. Well, I think I can do this, and I think this. I think. No, you've got to get back to where the star is. And you, if you get back to where the star is and do exactly what God's want, word wants you to do and serve him that way, he'll take you straight to the Christ child. And he will change everything. 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 I encourage you today to take a lesson from these wise men. Even the best, even the best can get messed up in their life. I'm going to close with this story. <clears throat> it's just a small white envelope 
stuck among the branches of our Christmas tree. No name, no identification, no inscription. <coughs> it has peaked through the branches of our tree for the past 10 years. It all began because my husband Mike hated Christmas. Oh, not the true meaning of Christmas, but the commercial aspects of it. Overspending, the frantic running around at the last minute to get a tie for Uncle Harry, and the dusting powder for Grandma. The gifts given in desperation because you couldn't think of anything else. Knowing he felt this way, I decided one year to bypass the usual shirts, sweaters, ties, and so forth. I reached for something special just for Mike. The inscription came in an unusual way. Our son Kevin, who was 12 that year, was wrestling at the junior level at the school he attended. And shortly before Christmas, there was a non-league match against a team sponsored by an inner-city church, and they were mostly black. These youngsters dressed in sneakers so ragged that shoestrings seemed to be the only thing holding them together. And it presented a sharp contrast to our boys in their spiffy blue and gold uniforms and sparkling new wrestling shoes. As the match began, I was alarmed to see that the other team was wrestling without headgear. <clears throat> it was a luxury that the rag team obviously could not afford. Well, we ended up walloping them. We took every weight class. And as each of their boys got up from the mat, he swaggered around in his tatters with his fault verado, a kind of street pride that could not acknowledge, acknowledge defeat. Mike, seated beside me, shook his head sadly. I wish just one of them could have won, he said. They have a lot of potential, but losing like this could take the heart right out of them. Mike loved kids, all kids, and he knew them, <clears throat> having coached Little League football, baseball, and lacrosse. That's when the idea for the present came. That afternoon, I went to a local sporting goods store and bought an assortment of wrestling headgear and shoes, and I sent them anonymously to the inner city church. On Christmas Eve, I placed the envelope on the tree and the note inside telling Mike what I had done and that this was to be his gift from me. His smile was the brightest thing that Christmas and in the succeeding Christmases and after that. And for each Christmas, I followed the tradition. One year sending a group of mentally handicapped youngsters to a hockey game. Another year, a check to a pair of elderly brothers who had, <clears throat> whose home had been burned to the ground the very week before Christmas, and on and on and on. The envelope became the highlight of our Christmas. It was always the last thing open on Christmas morning, and our children, ignoring their new toys, would stand with wide eyes in anticipation as the dad lifted the envelope from the tree to reveal its contents. As the children grew, the toys gave way to more practical presents. But the envelope was never lost, and it never, ever lost its appeal. The story, though, doesn't end there. You see, we lost Mike last year due to dreaded cancer. When Christmas rolled around, I was still so wrapped in grief that I barely even put up the tree. But Christmas Eve found me placing an envelope in the tree. And in the morning, it was joined by three more envelopes. Each of our children, unbeknownst to the others, had placed an envelope on the tree for their dad. The tradition has grown and someday will expand even further with our grandchildren standing around the tree with wide open anticipation, watching as their fathers take down the envelope to see what was in it. Mike's spirit, like the Christmas spirit, will always be with us. You see, when you know the Christ child like you should, Christmas becomes a thing of joy even in the saddest and darkest of moments. 
So I would encourage you, every time you hear Merry Christmas, be reminded Jesus is with you and he loves you and that you'll overcome anything. And get, give that gift this year. And when you give it, give it to somebody and give it in a way they'll understand. Merry Christmas! And, and they'll know something's happened. They'll know. Maybe one of them will ask you, why, why do you say Merry Christmas like that? Glad you asked. Let me tell you. And you may get to tell them about Jesus. Okay? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Father, we love you. We thank you that we can say Merry Christmas for the right reason. Help us, Father, today. As we go forth, teach us that we can say Merry Christmas and it can remind us that all is well because God is in my heart. All is well because this is the season of joy. And we're here to worship him. And we're going to do it your way, God, not ours. And for those of us who have detoured, forgive us. Forgive us. Let us get right back on the right track and lead us to that blessed hope, Jesus Christ. Amen.